going to uh, back to that idea of like religion being an orienting principle, something that sheds light on everything. Um, I'm going to offer here St. John of the Cross as anti-Nietzsche. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so uh, St. John of the Cross has this sketch. He has a few that he did. And one of them is the ascent to Mount Carmel, as he calls it. And it's the two, two different ways up the mountain. And at the top of the mountain, he has this phrase, here there is no longer any way because for the just man, there is no law. He is a law unto himself. Mm. So you have Nietzsche on one hand, which says the Ubermensch is a law unto himself mm. by his own creation. And then you have St. John of the Cross that says the just man is a law unto himself. He has no law. Right. He, is, he is one. But the difference here is that the just man has submitted himself to a higher principle yep. mm. and has integrated that principle. So the law still exists and rules still in dogma, mm-hmm. like all these different things, but they're not... They're not so much that it's like, oh, should I, should I steal in this moment? Like, like right. let me think about this. Right. You know, I don't know. Should what I does steal? What the church say? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's like, is right. this right? Is this wrong? It's just, no, no, you start to live it so integrated, you know, it's like, you know what, this, I don't even need to think about yep. stealing. I don't yep. even need right. to think about this, this sin, whatever. It's wrong. And I, I, I know it. Yeah. I know it intuitively. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a self-creation. It's a discipline. Yep, to a yeah. higher principle. That's the that's, life paradox of the well, self-sacrifice, and, that, and that's the um, that's the idea that like Christ came to set us free, mm-hmm. like uh, and and that's like that's what he means by freedom from the law. It's not that you're um, that the law has no bearing on your life. Is that you are so free that the law is integrated and like every everything you choose uh, is in accordance with the way reality has right. presented itself. Yep. It's the same thing with um, Virgil and Dante at the end of um, the Purgatory where Dante is disciplined, you know, all his passions are ordered correctly, where Virgil is like, I can't help you anymore. You are so ordered that you can let pleasure be your guide. Yeah. As in like, whatever brings you pleasure because mm-hmm. you're so ordered is for the good. Right. And that's the goal. And and ultimately, that freedom is, uh, I like how you put it, is that's the, that's the anti-Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. All right. It's because if for the atheist existentialist, freedom is the ultimate good, well then, imagine freedom properly oriented. Yep. Freedom is still the ultimate good for the Christian, mm-hmm. but it's uh, like as you said, it's it's under a principle, right? Um, so yeah, if you uh, like talking psychologically, um, let's say you have the passion to steal versus the passion to not steal, you can still argue that you know you're just kind of at the behest of your passions, and that again, this was kind of like the Freudian project was like you know either. For or against, these passions are just kind of like subconscious repressions that you're acting on. Um, but, you know, again, it's like the passion to not steal seems to play out better mentally than the passion to steal. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like if these, there's these like uh, amalgam of desires and um, like impulses, then you could argue like, well, the religious impulse is just one of many impulses. It's like, yeah, but this one doesn't cause neurosis. <laughs> you know? Right, right, so, right. So this is, in fact, this is like even psychologically proven to be a good. Mm-hmm. Right. This is not some, right. like, it is a metaphysical claim, but it's also psychologically proven that a moral adherence to something like don't steal is better than stealing. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, uh, Carl Jung calls it a religious instinct. Yeah. And But not to downplay this, like, well, on a Freudian interpretation, is like, well, it's one of many instincts and impulses. Mm-hmm. But for Jung, it's an instinct in the same way as, you know, as he says, uh, birds build certain nests and migrate. It's yep. like, if you do not allow them to do those things, bad things happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's the yeah. same thing. It's like, this is an instinct that cannot be just bred out right. very easily. Yep. I think Jonathan Haidt even had a quote about that, like uh, getting people to give up, you know, religious belief would be like getting people to live on the moon. It's like, yeah, y- you could do it, <laughs> you know, but it would... Hella hard. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be really hard. It's going to take a long time. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, same thing. It's like, this is an instinct that is so ingrained yeah. that it's it's not easily given up. Um, right. Going back to the, the law and freedom thing, uh, I think St. Paul says the same thing about kind of uh, the law pre-Christ was because we were sort of like children that needed discipline. Mm. But now that, you know, freedom has come, you you now can li- you can now live a fullness of life, um, it's with with more of like an integrated law, not sort of disciplinarian right. law. Yeah, wow. I'm sure Matt, you know this with kids. It's like the whole point about discipline is so that they can be free. Yeah, right. That's the point. Mm-hmm. It's not again. I think this is where kind of um, religious 
uh, cliches come in of like, oh, it's rules, it's rules, it's mm-hmm. rules. I think Jonathan, he, or I'm sorry, um, Jonathan Peugeot brought this up of like, yep. you know, it's ethics and rules. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, no, it's actually meant to be integrated and then you're free. Yep. And, and it's, it's not just guardrails. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you see uh, like what Jung was talking about, about the, re- the religious instinct, um, if you take that one step further and saying, if this instinct exists, it, there might be something like an imago dei, right? Like an image of God within you. Um, and, there, and then from there, now you have human rights, dignity of the individual. Yep. Like that's where all this springs for. So mm-hmm. if you take it out, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. right. And then that even bleeds into things like, um, like, why would I raise my kids to be autonomous, autonomous individuals? Unless if I thought that that was worth having an other person being an other. Right. Yeah. You know, like, why, why don't I just set the rules for my own sake? Right. And it's because I see the image of God in them. And like, that's all a religious instinct. Right. You know? Right. And this, um, you know, this is the whole like project of figuring out your life according to uh, Saint, um, Saint Ignatius of Loyola is you were created for a purpose. You were created for an end. You were created in image and likeness of God. You will return to him. You know, exitus reditus. Yes. <laughs> no, you come from him. You will return to him. So how do I best do that? But again, this implies that I have a creator. This implies I have a, I have a human nature. This impl- implies I'm made in the image and likeness of God, which means I have rights yep. and duties and dignity. But if you're not coming from anything and not returning to anything... It's it's hard to make mm-hmm. an argument that you should do things, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Or you have duties. Mm-hmm. Yep. 